So it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Jack Rothman, who's going to talk to us about Pelham Bay birding. Jack has been birding in Pelham Bay since the early 90s. He's usually there four to five times a week in all seasons. He's been doing free walks in Pelham Bay since 2007 with his group, City Island Bird. And he has introduced hundreds of people to the joy of birding. So welcome to Bird Chat, Jack. Feel free to start your share. Oh, hello. So that's a typical City Island Birds walk. Uh, this was probably one of the last ones we did in, uh, in the fall. Uh, there are some people who are on the Zoom who can see uh, the folks that are here, who are here. And you can also see Randy on here. Uh, he used to come to our bird walks as well. I know he used to come uh, to yours. So I want to talk a little bit about birds, a little bit about the people who bird the park, and a little bit of history of Pelham Bay Park. And welcome to the Bronx. Let's go on. So Pelham Bay Park is about, whoops, is about three times the size and this thing is blocked here. Um, I'm trying to get this out of the way. Three times the size of, Pelham, of um, Central Park. Uh, we have shoreline, salt marsh, um, and a lot of it has changed uh, from what it originally was. There are two zones in the park. This zone, this area up here, is called the Northern Zone, and down here is called the Southern Zone. And they're really not connected. You have to get on the highway to go from one area to the next. This area called Hunter Island is no longer an island, as you could see, as is uh, a twin island over here and two tree island over here. These were all separated and filled in by Robert Moses in the 1930s to make Orchard Beach. And there's Orchard Beach. And so for me, I live on City Island. It's, it's a, it could be a walk or a drive right over or a bike ride right over uh, to do some birding. It's a huge park, and there's a lot of things to see in here and a lot of territory to cover. There's a fellow named Kazimirov uh, who was instrumental in keeping this park wild and keeping it the way it was. Otherwise, it probably would have ended up uh, uh, as another uh, garbage dump or landfill, as they call it now. Um, he wrote a book uh, because he claims to have grown up with the last Algonquin Indian who lived in Pelham Bay Park. Um, we don't know if the book is true or not, or if it's just an allegory, um, but he makes it sound pretty, um, pretty true. Uh, you can still get this book. It's available on Amazon. You, if you go to Botanical Gardens, the Bronx Botanical Gardens, you'll see some trails named after him as well, as well as in Pelham Bay Park, uh, the Kazimirov Trails. So let's see, who birds this park? Um, right now, when we began, um, there were probably four people birding this huge park with any regularity. Once in a while, we would get an Audubon group coming through to look for um, long-eared owls or uh, just to walk around. Um, you know, it's like people don't want to come to the Bronx, I guess. Um, this is a fellow, Brendan, who was probably one of the original, the four of us who used to uh, walk through the park. Um, I, we were a pretty motley crew, but we were the only ones that were here on any regular basis. Um, so in 2007, when the internet got popular and people started blogging, I decided I would see if I can get some more people to come to Pelham Bay Park. So I started this club called City Island Birds. Um, what you're looking at is actually the Brooklyn Birding Club coming to visit one day. Uh, I, we went on to this little island, and it's, when we got on that island, uh, somebody started shouting, the tide, and the tide, if you look at it now, you can see the tide is well below the, the boards, but uh, the tide came up on us while we were on the island, and we had to run across uh, to keep our feet from getting wet. Uh, it was interesting. I, I learned something about tides. So that's our first walk in, in 07. Uh, and now we have, whoops, now we have, um, our walks have become really big. Um, sometimes we do, the, we do the walks midweek because on the weekends we just get 30 or 35 people coming. Um, and some of the walks now have been, we do it with New York City Audubon. New York City Audubon, quote unquote, discovered Pelham Bay Park. They saw that there were so many people birding here, and I, and I like to think that I brought them here. 
uh, and they are now doing walks, and I, I'm doing some of the walks for them. Um, people say, well, is it safe? Yeah, it is safe. I've, not, I've never had a problem in 30 years. Uh, we do get dogs running free once in a while, be off leash. Uh, you get annoying bikers coming through on, on the trails where you're burning, but basically it's safe. Um, some funny things happen. This fellow Pete once found, uh, this was on one of our early walks, what looks like, and, and I believe is, a, a real voodoo doll. And back in the day, people were doing all kinds of strange things here. Um, and if you talk to Pete, um, he's, he, he put it in his backpack, well, his side pack, I should say. And um, he went, went home to show it to his wife, and he said it was gone. It jumped out of his backpack. He doesn't understand. He really believes that. It's very funny. Anyway, we do find some interesting things here. Okay, let's start with Orchard Beach. Most of you know where Orchard Beach is. Maybe you were here once or twice. Orchard Beach is really very nice now. Maybe you were here in the 70s when it wasn't nice. It's clean, and it's nice, and it's quiet. This is what it looks like. Uh, it's a man-made beach. The parking lot is gigantic. And this parking lot sometimes floods, and especially when it floods in late April, a lot of wonderful things can be found here. So I, th I can't read this because it's being blocked by this thing up here. <laughs> Basically, uh, it's almost the size of the Central Park Reservoir. It's a huge parking lot, and I've never, ever seen it full. Most maybe is half full. And this, this photograph of this Western Sandpiper was taken in right in that parking lot uh, and you can see all of the birds we've seen here just in the puddles. Lesser yellow legs, semi-palmated plover, sandpipers, leaf sandpaper, pectoral sandpiper, bared sandpiper, and it goes on. And all of these can be seen here. On a, if you catch a rainy day and after the rain in late August, they're here. Some of the people, and this was in 2017, where we really, we really had quite a great... Uh, migration of these birds, the shorebirds coming through. There were always photographers here. It was a lot better than um, crouching down in the mud uh, at Jamaica Bay if you wanted to photograph these birds. So these were some of the birds that were there. Uh, I remember getting there one day and there were wimbrels walking around. Yellow legs are fairly common. You can go there to Pelham Bay Park and hang around the parking lot for a while. You may be lucky to see a peregrine. They come there regularly to bathe, uh, especially after a rainstorm. There's a guy, Pete Gustos. I don't know if anybody knows him, but he's there all the time trying to photograph them. He gets some good photos. And if you get to the parking lot, you got to drive around because you never know what you're going to find. Um, it's mostly ringbills and herring gulls and laughing gulls, but you do get an occasional uh black gull or something else that's interesting um a couple of years ago my friend joe called me and said hey there's a caspian turn right in the parking lot you don't have to go go anywhere to see it and that was kind of nice too so the parking lot can be good right opposite and if i go back i can show you what i'm talking about there's a lagoon let's go back a little bit whoops to the map this is the parking lot, and over here is a lagoon where I'm showing you. And that lagoon can also be really good. I'm, I'm going ahead. Um, we get baldies there, um, and a, a nice array of ducks, hoodies, and, and red-breasted merganser, and bufflehead, and black duck, and, and both grebes, horn and, and pipebill grebes. And you, don't, you can just get out of your car with your binoculars or your scope. You don't, ha you don't even have to walk. One year we had the nesting oyster catchers right on the beach. They were nesting be between the people who were sunbathing and walking in between the bodies. It was really kind of cute. Um, eventually I asked Parks Department if they could uh, put up some kind of barrier and they tied some tape around some garbage cans. Um, but eventually what happened was the gulls got the eggs and that was the end of the oyster catchers nesting on the beach. They do nest on a jetty and on one of the smaller islands. So it, it, it's always great to see them come back every year. And then along that lagoon, um, 
we get a great variety of finches, um, uh, sparrows, I mean. And we do get uh, finches too, but mostly we, we can get a clay colored and a swamp and a white crown and, and, and all kinds of field sparrows. It's a great time in, in the fall. So that's right along the lagoon. You have to walk there in the morning and you have to be there. You have to be pretty quiet. If you go to group, it's kind of tough, especially my groups, which are very social. <laughs> If you get onto the beach and you want to do some scoping, it's freezing cold some days. Um, it's too cold for me now. I used to stay there all day, but I can't anymore. Um, but uh, this year we've seen all of the birds that you see listed below here. Um, long tails are easy to find, black ducks, uh, great cormorants, golden eyes. Um, I didn't see a gannet this year. Um, but we get we do uh, Richard Arasil and some other people um, had some razor bills out there. You can, if you hang around long enough, you're going to see some good stuff. Uh, but as I said, it can be pretty cold. This year wasn't so bad. It was okay. All right, let's go over to Hunter Island now. This is where I spend most of my time. And as I explained before, uh, it's no longer no longer an island. Uh, it's attached to the mainland. People get confused by that. This place uh, was filled with mansions uh, in the 1900s, uh, and then in the, 19, in the late 1920s or the mid-1920s when the, the stock market crashed, it was 29, I guess, uh, the mansions were abandoned, uh, and the Parks Department took over this area. So you, you'll see a lot of men back there uh, with, with metal detectors trying to find stuff. Um, artifacts from when the mansions were there. There is one mansion left, and I will we'll talk about that one um, later on, because um, we buried there too. The sign that says Forever Wild is no longer there. You know, we were promised that this place would, would be kind of untouched. It would be forever wild, but uh, those signs are taken down and nothing is forever wild. <laughs> so that's what Hunter Island looks like. There is a stand, you see where there's little houses, there's a stand of trees over here where we, off, where we used to find lots of long-eared owls, saw-wet owls, um, the barred owls are there now. Uh, we generally get one or two each season, and I'm not sure if that's why we don't see the saw-wets anymore and we don't see the long-eared owls. They used to be quite a lot. I've seen as many uh, as six uh, long-eareds in the trees at one time, but that was years ago. Um, so this is a terrific place to walk. And there's just about everything you can want in this spot. And it's, it loops back down. Uh, and these two bumps over here are two lookouts where you can, put, you can put your scope out and you can go right out and you can scan. We have deer. We have ticks. Um, People have been feeding them. This is something new, and it's become a real problem. People bring fruit for the, for the deer, and the deer now seem to approach. It's not good. We've been complaining. But Parks Department does not have enough people to send out. Uh, there may be three agents in the whole Bronx. We also have a problem with the deer eating. Like I, I'm sure you have the same problem, eating all the undergrowth. Um, and so I don't know what's going to happen to the forest there. The forest is also being devastated by bittersweet and porcelain berry, and now we have mile a minute. Uh, Parks Department is just not given enough money to have anything done. So it's kind of, kind of sad. Yeah, as I said, we have ticks, and uh, just like Westchester. So if you decide to come here, you have to make sure you're you know, dressed appropriately and you use DEET. So as I said, there were lots of owls here in the winter. Um, Stall wets were easy to find. They were almost at eye level. Uh, and then the, the pines where they used to stay sort of start, got too tall, and then they started falling down. And we don't really see as many. I, I haven't seen one this year, and I haven't seen a long year this year. Uh, we, we do have the bards, and I'm not sure the reason that the long years and the, and the saw wets are not here. It's probably, be, I'm thinking it's because the barred owls are here. I don't know. This is uh, Jose. He was there. Oh, he came a couple of years and he was always in the tree right near Bartopel Mansion. 
Uh, he's, he, he went under the same tree. You can see the little green on his vent uh, down over here. And so we can identify him. And some people would say, Jack, you know where there's an owl? And I take him right there, and they would be thrilled to see the soul went owl. So these, these were seen right up in the, in the pines, uh, right up in, um, uh, on Hunter Island. Sometimes the, the, the long-eared would be just sitting out in the sun waiting for you to look at them. They weren't bothered. And as I said, you guys also get uh, lots of barn owls. There's me with a soulwet a, a bunch of years ago. I don't know if you know Trudy and um, Drew. Trudy and Drew used to do, um, they used to uh, uh, tap, uh, put on rings on their legs, and they used to put in radio transmitters. Um, but because there's no more soulwets, they haven't been coming. Yes, we have great horns nesting here. Uh, at one time, there were six pair. Um, most of the time, we could always find a, a pair in the tree, this, this hollowed out old tree. Uh, and everybody in the, not everybody in the Bronx, but a lot, a lot of people who were, even weren't birders, dog walks, they all knew where this owl was. And uh, it, it really wasn't good for the owls. They would come, they would bang on the tree to get them to open up their eyes. So it, it was like that for many years. This tree fell or this dead tree, the snag fell. And in a way, it was good. I can't find them all the time, the great horns, but at least I know they're not being harassed. We have warblers. It's not like Central Park. You actually have to look for the warblers with your binoculars and walk around. Uh, it's not like you could ask somebody and say, hey, did you see a whatchamacallit? And say, yeah, there's one over there. It's not like that. Um, you have to work for your birds here. It's a big park. And that's what it's like to scope from the, from the rocks um, on Hunter Island. Um, that's a bunch of us. From, this is a few years back. Um, looks like it was a cold day. We must have been looking for ducks. It's quite beautiful. I think it's beautiful anyway. Um, that's to the left is... Two Trees Island, and to the right is Twin Island. They are connected at low tide. Um, a couple of years, maybe three years ago, during the summer, uh, a family walked out onto Two Tree Island. The tide came up, and they got stuck and had to be rescued by the Coast Guard. I always thought that was funny, um, especially since he was a doctor. I and mean, he probably should have known better, but I guess everybody makes mistakes. Um, we used to have, and it depends on the year, thousand scalp in the, in the area, uh, greater scalp in the area, uh, right between Hunter and Twin Islands. Um, we, we haven't had that many, but we do have other stuff. Um, as you can see, Goldeneye, Widgeon, Gadwall, just about anything you can find in Long Island Sound, probably anything you can find in Westchester, uh, from Rye or, or, um, Edith Reed or, or, or that area. Um, purple sandpipers, uh, there's a photograph I took of the um, of a razor bill. He was on and he was on the way out. So was, and he, I don't know if he spotted me. He was too far out to spot me, but I, that was taken with a 400 millimeter lens and it's not that terrible considering how far away it was. Okay, we're gonna move over to Turtle Cove. Turtle Cove is right near the golf driving range. I don't know if people know where that is. And it was in two sections with a berm between it. One side was uh, salt water and the other side was kind of brackish fresh water. And I'll show you what I mean. So this is a driving range right here. Um, little parking lot. And this is Turtle Cove. And this is an old map. This was a berm. Uh, by a berm, I mean it was a lump, a big hump of soil. And underneath, behind, there was a small culvert under here, very small. And this was all salt water. And this was brackish water when it rained. And so it was great. We had hoodies in here. We had all lots of good stuff during the winter that was salt water. We would get wood ducks on the, on the fresh water. And then, of course, the city 
uh, got sandy money, and they decided they didn't want this to be fresh water anymore for whatever reason. And so they built a huge culvert under here and a huge culvert under here and put a bridge here. And so this is all salt water. It's still a great place to go, but it's not nearly as good. We used to be able to park uh, at this place called Rodman's Neck, which is right here's the parking lot. Rodman's Neck is where they shoot off the bombs. The bomb squad comes and it's the police firing range. But we were able to park there up until the pandemic and they closed it off. So if you want to come to Turtle Cove, you can try and park in the driving range. And sometimes the general, the guys there will, won't bother you. And other times they'll say, are you golfing? And if you say no, they'll chase you. They're usually pretty nice though. So there was a monorail that ran through Turtle Cove. Um, and as I explained in this little uh, piece here, um, the, the culvert uh, underneath changed everything, but it's still pretty good. We still get marsh wrens and warblers and flycatchers and orioles. There's always, once, at least once or twice a season, there are a couple of green herons that come through. Um, and I took this photograph of a seaside sparrow over there. Uh, he was just sitting up. Uh, you don't see too many seaside sparrows here. That's what the, ju ju just put this as information. This is what the monorail in the 1900s that uh, ran through uh, that area of Turtle Cove. And then one day, the monorail fell over. 100 people went on it instead of 40. Um, and that was when the Bronx, uh, when, when City Island um, became part of New York City. City Island and this, the area around here was all part of Pelham, New York. The monorail fell over. New York City said to the people of City Island and around the area, we'll give you bus service if you join, the, if you join New York City. And so here we are. That's why we were in the Bronx and we're not in Westchester. I mean, it was better for my taxes, but you know. So there's a lot of good stuff at Turtle Cove. Um, picture of a clapper rail running across when we're standing there. Um, last year, last two years ago, there, um, we had some other good stuff. I'm trying to think what it was. It was a, an American bittern right across the other side. It was the first time I'd ever seen one there. Joe McManus found it. You don't know what you're going to find. Uh, the, the fellow Brendan, whose picture was up there, found this little hummingbird nest. The cars were whizzing by, trucks were whizzing by, and this uh, hummingbird was nesting there. Um, one day we went to see it, and uh, it was gone. I think I'm, I'm not sure whether it the it it it, it uh, the, the birds fledged, or um, there were lots of Orioles around, it, or if the Orioles got the eggs. Um, I hadn't been there for a few days. And we do get bobolink, believe it or not. They're not only in Croton. Um, we get bobolink and we get meadowlarks. And right along that trail, if you keep walking uh, through a turtle cove, past a little bridge, uh, there's a tree with these berries. Although the tree is now getting devastated by porcelain berry, uh, it's really good for warblers and um, Cedar wax rings. They were always in that tree. And, then, and these are all birds that were taken right here in Pelham Bay Park. They're all here. Pretty much anything you can get anywhere else. We really have a lot of nesting Baltimore Orioles during migration and orchard or Orioles. They seem to be all over the place. And it's really great for new birders because they get to see a pretty bird. Uh, yes, we have great, great crested flycatchers and eastern kingbirds nesting right there on Turtle Cove. And these pictures were all taken there. This kingbird let me come pretty close. I, I can't even remember. <laughs> and as usual, the parking lot is always the, the best place to be because as soon as I went to put all my stuff away in the parking lot and I was finished, um, this, the garlic tanager uh, came right into my face right above my car. So in 2006, David Kunstler, who used to be the, wild, the wildlife manager for the park, and there is none anymore, he retired, 
Uh, he did a he did a breeding bird a breeding bird survey, and found 82 nesting species and 264 uh, species that can be found here. It's probably I'm sure it's changed by now, um, but I, we won't know unless somebody wants to do a breeding bird survey all over again. And in Turtle Cove, we get some crazy stuff like this Elvis duck uh, that was in there. Um, haven't seen much this year. We always used to, we, we always had hoodies in there, and every year is different. Next year, the hoodies will be filling up the place. So I couldn't figure out. I thought this might have been a cross between a gadwall, an American, American witch, and I don't know. I was trying to figure that one out. Okay, Bartow Pell Mansion. That's the, the last mansion that is standing now. Um, it was a great place to bird. It's still pretty good in some of the areas. Um, in order to make it look pretty, they cleared a lot of the undergrowth. And uh, because with less undergrowth, there seems to be less birds, but it's still pretty good. So this is the parking lot. This is all part of Pelham Bay Park. Uh, this lagoon is the same lagoon. This is Orchard Beach over here, the Orchard Beach parking lot that we're looking at, this little piece over here. So we're looking across. And if you get back here, these woods back here are good for owls. And there's a path you can get through. It's good for owls. We used to get long ears and saw wets. And there, there could be one back there. I haven't been back there this, this year. And right across from the mansion, Right across from the parking lot in here, we, there are a stand also of hemlocks, which were great for owls. And you just have to keep on checking. Um, behind the mansion, there's this little carriage house. And back behind this little carriage house, right in here, lots of nesting species. Now, I know you can't remember all this stuff, but if you decide to come to Pelham Bay, you can email me. And if I'm available, I'll show you around. This is behind the mansion. Oh, this, this was kind of a shame. They had a lot of really old growth here. And they just, whenever they give in money, they want to change things. And they, they ripped out everything and replanted. Uh, there was lots of nesting species and all that old growth. Things change. This is a path that goes along the water. Very interesting graveyard back there with Ann Hutchins. Ann Hutchison from Hutchison River Parkway uh, and the story of the Suwannoi Indians. There's a graveyard back there. Um, now we'll move over to the Split Rock. There's a Split Rock Trail, which is right near, which is where the golf course is. There are two trails there. Um, there are two golf courses there, Pelham and Split Rock. Um, if you take the trail that I'll show you in a minute, uh, there are nesting barn swallows. They're almost, they'll be here soon. In a month or so, uh, hundreds of them nest under there. The train comes by and it goes over the trestle and the birds, they don't care. I mean, if you're standing under there, the rumbling is, is incredible, but they don't seem to care. And we get bluebirds around there on the trail. That's what Split Rock looks like. Um, Kazimirov actually made them move the Hutchinson River Parkway over. They wanted to go right through and take out Split Rock. And there is a history there. Supposedly, Ann Hutchinson hid there from the Sawano Indians in 1643. Uh, but other accounts say she was living somewhere else. So um, it's, it's kind of interesting. We used to do walks up to this spot. Um, haven't done one up here in a long time. Let's get over to the southern zone. That's the side that I was showing you down to the south. I don't know how much time I have. I'm going to move a little faster. I'm trying to talk as fast as I can. The southern zone has a landfill, and the landfill is closed off. It used to be a super fund. It's no longer a super fund. And it now belongs to Parks Department, but Parks Department doesn't have enough personnel to man it, so it just stays, it just stays the way it is behind barbed wire. So this is, the, this is the southern zone. This is the landfill. Look at this trail right here. This area right here during migration is pretty incredible. Um, 
and I'm going to show you why in a minute. Uh, it's probably the highest point in the park. Maybe that's it. This is the landfill. On the landfill, you can almost always get a harrier. There are a couple of kestrels that are always there. But this, this spot right over here is where you want to be. Um, okay, there's the harrier. They're always working this, this place. This fellow, uh, Matthew Benoit, Matthew Benoit, who's a local birder. Um, I put his picture in here. This is on one of our walks. Uh, decided one day he wanted to do a morning flight. He got there before dawn on that spot. And he saw 84 species in about three hours. I want to show you the checklist. And the way he birds, he, I said, where's your, where's your binoculars, Matthew? He doesn't use it. He uses his camera with a 300 or 400 millimeter lens. And he IDs the birds right in flight. It's incredible. And you can see, this is in one morning. There it is. And you can see uh, common nighthawks, upland sandpiper, which he ID'd in the air, skimmers, common loon, the harrier, hoopers, red bellies, 16 red bellies, 44 flickers, 280 phoebes. 18 blue-headed vireo. I mean, this is something you would see in Cape May or, or another spot. And this was toward the end of the fall migration. It, it was pretty amazing. 12, 225 robins, 12 swainsons, 145 cedar waxwings. And he's got pictures, so it, it, there it goes. Uh, and he, he talks about how he... Um, he had more birds, but people came walking through with dogs or bicycles, and then the birds would all just go. Um, it was pretty crazy. And I, if he didn't do that, I would never know. And so we're going to have to do some morning flights over there. And here's his warblers. One attempted landing on my hat. Three Cape Mays. 46 parallels. 16 magnolias. One Blackburnian. Okay, the date on this is September 29th. Okay, so, I mean, we have everything. There's, there's lots of stuff here. Uh, as you can see, meadowlarks and bobolinks. This is the only orange crown I ever saw in the park, so I put his picture in. Um, there's a bobolink right here on that path that, I was, that he was burning on. Um, I found that. And lots of nesting birds. We get hairies and downies and red bellies, occasionally a redheaded, and occasionally a pileated comes through. They're not... They're not here regularly, but we'll see one or two a season. Great horned owls, you can see the, uh, these are two um, owlets, actually. This one looks like he's ready to go. And so, so, a younger bird in there. Uh, and the usual winter, you know, fox sparrows and Lincolns and all that other good stuff. So that's Pelham Bay Park in a nutshell. Um, this is the end of City Island. And if you, need, if you need laughing gulls or anything like that, you can just go to Johnny's Reef. You can throw your French fries up in the air and you'll get some laughing gulls. You might get something interesting. I don't know. I don't know if Bonaparte's like, like French fries, but uh, most of the other gulls love them. And it's fun to go back here. And you can, have, you can leave Pelham Bay Park, go down to the end of City Island and have fun. So you're all welcome to come. We're going to be having walks here. Uh, beginning of the end of March, every uh, Sunday, I'll be doing some of them, and uh, Joe McManus will be doing some of them, and uh, some other people are doing them uh, this year. So if you want to come, you're, you're invited, and you can also email me if you know you're going to be down here, and I'm going to be out birding. I'd be glad to show you around.